Welcome to The Green Pretenders, a sustainably challenged podcast. My name's Simon. And I'm Sean. And today we have decided to talk about eco activism and people in the world that are doing big things to try and make the climate crisis and eco topics at the forefront of all of our minds. Yes, we are indeed. I don't know about you, Simon, but for years when I was younger, Greenpeace was the kind of the only thing that I was really, really aware of, I think. And I remember thinking that Greenpeace was something to do with some like crazy hippy dippy people that did weird stuff. And that's all I understood of it. I just thought like, oh, these are extreme earth people. Exactly. Yeah, I had the exact same experience. So these were kind of people who tied themselves to trees or, you know, like they got arrested. They were chasing boats. Yeah, hippy dippy. But I've come to realise that that is actually a very brave thing. Yeah. You know, that sort of civil disobedience, you know, non-violent protest. I didn't actually know this um, until this week, but Greenpeace weren't founded with the intention of being, you know, an eco-climate activist group necessarily, were they? No, exactly. They were founded in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, named after a boat, actually. And they were in the anti-nuclear weapon um, protest movement. Um, They were founded in Canada, Mm -hmm. in Vancouver. And yeah, obviously nowadays, with all these organisations, the climate is, I think, one of the biggest things they focus on, just because it has become so um, clear that that is the biggest threat to planet Earth. Mm. I guess that's the thing about people who are activists at heart is that they will focus on whatever is the most pressing issue. So yeah, their kind of um, evolution from nuclear weapons to the climate is is an interesting one because I guess being a young person in, in the late 60s, early 70s, the prospect of these weapons would have been like astounding. And I think now we've almost become a bit numbed to that like we're just aware that the nuclear weapons exist we're aware that certain world leaders have their fingers on the button but people have just got used to the idea maybe and it's kind of worrying to think what if that same journey happens with with the climate like eventually will people just kind of give up making it their main fight because what can you do sort of thing exactly yeah yeah there's a bit of a um, danger that inertia and um sort of you know I don't want to say laziness but uh, yeah you kind of just give up and you give in and you kind of like well what can you do Mm. I think a lot of activists also um, have that feeling you know they get very frustrated and very uh, you know you can get depressed because it is very depressing to actually fight for the climate when so many people in the world are doing the exact opposite Mm. Um, and they're often very powerful and very rich yeah I guess very powerful and very rich could now apply to Greenpeace they are very big and I think that's kind of a little bit of an issue that I have with them not necessarily that they're big it's great if a if a movement grows but Greenpeace is an organization it's not a movement and um, my main issue with them is uh, their aggressive fundraising Mm. I think that is just something that really puts me off I know that every sort of environmental organization has is struggling and uh, they don't take money from governments or corporations but uh, that means that they uh, yeah very aggressive in their fundraising and I've been called and unfortunately it's not someone from Greenpeace they've hired a call center to um, get someone to call you and and raise raise money and at that point you're thinking where exactly is this money going pound for pound exactly yeah and they co-founded an a body that uh, you know acts for transparency in in ngos but um regardless you kind of it leaves you with like a weird feeling in the tummy that you know where where is this money going and yeah i wonder you know because some of the huge things that they've achieved um would they be able to do that without the clout that they have and would they have the clout that they have without the money that they have and the marketing and all of that it's like this kind of vicious circle that if you want to make big differences do you have to be that big beast 
and will that inevitably mean funds going to places that we might not kind of feel great about yeah it is a good question and I think um, it's a bit of an open question because I think it's difficult to come to a conclusion on that. Yeah, I, t- I mean, I certainly didn't ask that with any <laughs> any idea of an answer myself. Yeah. It was very yeah. rhetorical. Yeah, but but it is, it's, it's relevant, I think, and, and, and we do need to ask ourselves these questions and I think it's never black and white, you know, and I think with all these organisations and movements of people, we do need to think critically so often uh, when we look at the media, for example, uh, they are just not very kind to Greenpeace. And I think I need to read all that information critically as well, because just because some, you know, newspaper or tabloid is is saying, oh, Greenpeace, they're a bunch of hippies and they're all corrupt. Um, is that true, though? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that doesn't mean that corruption doesn't exist, but... The media will insist on giving these people a bad rap. Like, we've seen this with Extinction Rebellion so badly, haven't we? Yeah, absolutely. What was it? Um, The old crusties? Is that what they dubbed them? Yeah, exactly. They're just a bunch of crusties. Um, which I think a lot of these groups, like Greenpeace as well and, and Extinction Rebellion, they're quite good at taking that criticism and um, turning it into something funny, you know, kind of like joking about themselves it's also what the LGBTQ community um, is really good at, you know, is like claiming back those words. And uh, Extinction Rebellion definitely claimed back the word crusties. Yeah. Um, and they turn it into a little song. It's like um, bullies in the playground. Bullies bully because they want to see someone affected and upset by what they've done. So if you laugh at what a bully does to you they'll get bored and move on because that's not their desired impact bullies often can't deal with confidence and i think um extinction rebellion as a movement has a lot of confidence and i think that's that's great i guess we described how we maybe viewed greenpeace when we were young as this kind of extreme hippy dippy all of that that is how loads of people see Extinction Rebellion now. I think they see Extinction Rebellion as something that is only for people who use joss sticks and crystals and never brush their hair. Like, I think that is a weird image that people have of Extinction Rebellion, which is just so bizarre. It's like, if there's anything in the world that affects everyone, that we can all mutually agree as a shared issue, it's like, it's climate change. So... It's, it's kind of sad to think that people have closed it off and sectioned it off as something that isn't for them. Yeah, and, uh, you know, if someone chooses that as their mission in life, I think that's to be applauded and not to be ridiculed. And in this case, those people are Roger Hallam and Gail Bradbrook, who founded Extinction Rebellion. But obviously now, as a movement, the idea of Extinction Rebellion is much more sort of leaderless I think they work really hard to be a community of people and there's no such thing as sort of the faces of it necessarily it's 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 just like we're all in this together yeah Extinction Rebellion is very young isn't it Mm. Um, it was founded in 2018 in the very city that we live in London. It's a little baby group. It is a baby group. And and you said rightly, it's a movement. So as opposed to Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth, for example, who are organisations, NGOs, Mm -hmm. non-governmental organisations, Extinction Rebellion is a movement. So I I read up a little bit and they do have uh, 10 principles. I'm not going to mention them all. You can all look it up on Wikipedia or better yet, um, sign up to their newsletter. But anyone who sticks to those 10 principles can actually use their branding, the Hourglass um, X. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think everyone by now knows the logo because it's been all of the news. Um, So they're a movement and uh, they've spread all over the globe, which is great. And they're very non-hierarchical. And I think that's very positive Mm. and very modern and... uh, yeah admirable and for anyone listening who maybe doesn't know too much about extinction rebellion other than what we've seen in the headlines the the closing the streets and the massive protests um you know extinction rebellion exists as simon says like all over the world and there's small actions happening everywhere within small communities and they do meetups and they do um debates and sessions and making things and crafting things and fixing things and 
the scale of the activity is so wide ranging and so all encompassing. So it's not just about people sitting in the street and stopping the traffic. It's it's such a, a huge web of stuff. It's great. And Extinction Rebellion is supported by uh, quite a few prominent um, eco activists or climate activists, aren't they? Yes, they are. Yeah, we all know the controversy of Queen of My Heart, Emma Thompson, Dame Emma Thompson, excuse me. Um, when she flew in and joined the protest in London and stood on the pink boat and gave her voice and name to that moment. But instead of taking anything on board from that protest, a lot of people chose to only take away the fact that there was potential hypocrisy and the fact that Emma Thompson had flown to join the protest. That was all they wanted to talk about. And they're deflecting away. And I do think that it's sad when things like that become the only conversation that's being had afterwards. Absolutely. And I think uh, the same goes for another very important, very inspiring individual at the moment, our very own Greta Thunberg. Yeah. Um, we're all claiming Greta because she's just, uh, I think she's our hero, especially of, of young people in this world all over the globe. And it's just ridiculous, isn't it? We've spoken about Greta before and the criticism that she gets for being a child. Yeah. How dare she? <laughs> and being female. How dare she? Uh, being from a middle class uh, background, uh, being from Sweden, having uh, braided hair, like... Um, the fact that she doesn't smile all that often, you know, cheer up, love, it may never happen. Well, sorry, mate, it is happening. It's called the climate crisis, so... Exactly. And she actually started a global youth protest just by um, making a sign and sitting outside the Swedish parliament every Friday... And, you know, I think people are just, uh, yeah, I don't know, jealous that she gets so much attention, mm. that she is uh, has principles. Mm -hmm. She's very young and she firmly believes in something and is going the whole way to fight for that issue. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, not a lot of us can, can say that we'd have the strength, the stamina um, to do that. And they also criticise her for having support. How dare she not do that all on her own? That's totally mad. I think people feel criticised, don't they? And they can't handle that. I mean, she often does say in no uncertain terms, this isn't good enough, adults aren't listening, people aren't doing enough. And so instead of having open ears and an open mind, people just feel criticised and angry at that. They feel offended by the fact that they're being told that maybe what they're doing isn't enough by a girl of all people um but yeah you're so right like who of us can say that we dedicate our lives to a cause say if you believe that this is our only life how much of your life are you willing to dedicate to something and i just think she's amazing for that you know there must be huge downsides for her she's not just free to do as she wishes or she can't show any chinks in her armor um, this is her life now and she's a legend absolutely and she has to deal with with horrible criticism and uh, you know if we think about um other famous people who you know maybe gained their fame by being a musician or an actor or you know they often deal much worse <laughs> with this criticism being personally attacked is a horrible thing. Probably also death threats. I'm sure there's a lot of death threats that she gets and she must sometimes feel very, um, you know, there's a certain danger uh, surrounding her and her family as well. So, yeah. It's funny, I've just been thinking about the other celebrities that are kind of quite um, vocal about the climate change and I immediately realise a level of hypocrisy that I've got because... I was thinking about Joaquin Phoenix and his Oscar speech mm -hmm. and he didn't really make it like a an acceptance speech for an acting award. He made it quite a deep and profound call to arms. But I actually rolled my eyes a bit at that. I was a bit like, oh, here we bloody go. Like, I found that quite um, pretentious or arrogant somehow. I don't know why, but I put this lens on it even though I'll happily sit here and tell everyone in the world that Emma Thompson's the greatest person on earth. So um, I just wanted to say one thing, actually, um, about uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, Joaquin Phoenix, Al Gore. These are men in suits. 
we criticise them way less than we criticise the women. They just don't get the the shtick. The women get the shtick. And I think that's very wrong and I'm calling it out. Because Leo, yes, he made a documentary. Um, He talks a lot about himself in that documentary. He talks about the films that he did. The Revenant is probably uh, mentioned five billion times. But yet I don't remember that a lot of people... Um, criticised him for it or called him out on it or you know just mentioned like yeah you're rich and white and male and I'm not saying you know I'm not criticising him as such because he's doing a good thing but why are we picking apart Emma Thompson and Greta Thunberg but not all the the men in suits yeah definitely there's an inconsistency there and and you've just been the best friend ever because you've made me feel much better about my hypocrisy (laughs) I I suddenly feel like, no, yeah, I will roll my eyes at Joaquin Phoenix, but not at Emma Thompson. Yes, I will do that. But um, yeah, what is that? Like, what is that? And it's so unconscious as well, because, you know, the people who were sending around articles taking down Emma Thompson about the Extinction Rebellion thing the minute after it happened and have never done that about Leonardo DiCaprio or Joaquin Phoenix, I'm sure they'd never even recognise it in themselves or say it out loud. I didn't like that because she's a woman. Obviously, it's not yeah. it's not a conscious thing that people do, but it's just this underlying issue that we're, like still won't go away and probably won't go away for a long, long time. Um, yeah. Bloody brilliant woman, speaking of women, um, who seems to be escaping some of this horrible backlash that women get because I think she's just too good for it. Wonderful, wonderful Jacinda Arden of New Zealand. And if I've said her name wrong, I'm really sorry. But what a woman. She's just so great and authentic and honest and real. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of world leaders could definitely take some notes from her. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing, isn't it, that of all the countries, ours, I think, is probably one of the worst at the moment because we have the infrastructure and the wealth and the ability to do something about this if we wanted to but we don't america and the uk are just complete embarrassments yeah and i think it goes to show that a lot of the uh, environmental groups and activists are actually from the us or the uk because we just can't rely on our governments to do anything about the climate crisis. We have to take to the streets, we have to protest, uh, we have to get organised ourselves and take it into our own hands because our leaders are just failing us. So speaking of which, what has your personal experience been of activism and protesting and getting out on those streets? So, I do not call myself a climate activist because I've been to very few protests actually and it is something that bothers me and that I I want to change in the future. However my experience with Extinction Rebellion for example was that I went to a rally in 2018 the year they were founded in Dalston where I live now and then I also went to the Easter Rebellion 2019 which I think you went to as well Sean? I did yeah. Neither of us did any um, overnight stints or anything did we? I mean dipping in and out we did our best yes and i did donate a bit of money to support them and the and the cause and uh i i took their stickers i took some flyers Mm -hmm. i put them up in my flat um i've definitely posted stuff about them and yeah showed my support that way which i know isn't enough but um it's a little bit of something Uh, i also went to the autumn rebellion that was obviously a lot tougher because the spring one was lovely weather. I think it was 20 degrees, sunshine. The autumn one was horrendous. It was raining. It was really bad weather. Um, and I felt so bad for them. Yeah. One of my good friends, Nikki Draver's absolute legend, wonderful human. She lives up in Durham, but she came down to London for in October for the autumn one um, and was there sort of camping out and doing it all and I went down one evening um and yeah it was freezing and it was rainy and they were all just in such good spirits it was absolutely amazing um and there was like conga lines happening and music and art and it was it was so great but you're right I really felt for them in the conditions and um 
at the point where it's wet and rainy and cold you've only really got your your real kind of stalwarts that are going to sacrifice their own comfort you know it's crazy because we we live very comfortably and i think um the more comfortably you live the less inclined you are to join the rebellion i mean that's a very broad generalization but um i didn't see like the super rich hanging out with the rebels yeah one of the things i thought was interesting about the easter one i remember going to waterloo bridge when they shut waterloo bridge in london and there was just big installations and people were there all day every day all night every night and people would come along in suits very expensive suits carrying a briefcase and they'd stop and they'd get out their phone and take a picture and then carry on walking (laughs) and it was like this kind of very almost theatrical like metaphor for it just watching these suited booted men you know that they're not going to sit down and join in even if their morals and their intentions and their principles stand with the rebellion yeah what do you think about the fact that people were upset about the inconvenience caused by it all like the roads being closed and that backlash how do you feel about that i think that the biggest disruption of normal life and i'm saying this in times of coronavirus is gonna be climate change it's gonna completely change this world if we just let it happen i think the disruption that they caused makes us aware that there's something else coming that is going to be way more disruptive and a bit of discomfort also makes us think and these people wouldn't have to cause these disruptions of of everyday life if there wasn't such a pressing issue Mm. we're getting to a point where your average peaceful protest doesn't do anything anymore you know we saw how millions of people came out in their droves over Brexit and things like that. I mean, I know that's a completely different issue and there's a whole question of democracy around that, but petitions and marches and um, lending your voice to a cause doesn't really go very far anymore, I don't think, because people know that they can just ignore it. The powers that be know that they just wait for that to go away. So without moving into violence, I feel like that disruption is, is necessary I think so too, I would agree. We need that radicalism and and it's a non-violent protest. And I think that is so important because, uh, you know, as opposed to other protests, for example, in France, where there's very violent clashes between protesters and the police. And there's a whole question mark, you know, over that. But uh, Extinction Rebellion is really not hurting or harming anyone. Um, the furthest I went personally on one of these protests interestingly wasn't actually an extinction rebellion protest it was when the government prorogued parliament last year and that got me so angry i honestly i was a camel and there was a straw on my back and it broke my back i walked from work straight down to westminster and i walked up and down the streets just crying hysterically with rage i didn't know what to do and you know i joined that protest and um i met up with my partner's wonderful sister Katie and we basically ended up staying it was the longest I've stayed at a protest and in the end there was a group of maybe 50 of us sat in the road just in front of Big Ben but why this is relevant is because the rest of the people who were left there were all from Extinction Rebellion and they were sharing so much information and wisdom with us about what we should do if we get arrested, what you say, what the police are allowed to sort of charge you with and what they're not, and how you can toe that line to make sure that you're never doing anything, you know, illegal. Um, And it was so interesting. And yeah, they were all from Extinction Rebellion and they were all so kind and they were just making sure that everyone felt safe. They're they're so resilient and so resourceful. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm just in awe with that whole movement Mm -hmm. um yeah i've been actually on one other climate march uh it was in brussels belgium in 2018 uh december and it was such a beautiful experience because there were so many people like it was quite big and it was also in the in the news in in the uk um and i think a march is just something so powerful and here's my pledge for once this crazy corona situation is over Mm -hmm. i'm gonna go to more climate protests in london and march for this cause yes i will join that pledge speaking of pledges actually 
I've got a pledge for my one of my eco groups. Yes, let's hear it. So we're sticking with doing two eco groups instead of an eco group and an eco poop because the times are tough and we need happiness. So my first eco group is a pledge to make body scrub out of coffee grounds, old used coffee grounds because I found this recipe and it's you just mix it with a bit of sugar and a bit of oil and bada bing bada boom you've got a body scrub I only found out about this this week and I haven't done it yet but it's my pledge and I'm excited yes girl Woo. your skin's gonna be so smooth oh yeah my first eco whoop is growing your own vegetables and plants in general uh, I've seen a lot of people doing that in in lockdown um, they tend to their gardens more to the house plants growing little uh, veg and I've been doing that myself I got some chili seeds and I've planted them and they're growing I'm going to post a photo on Instagram fantastic I look forward to seeing that photo um, my second eco group is making clothes we've talked a lot about how secondhand clothes are the way forwards because there's enough clothes in the world to keep us all dressed for the rest of our lives already but I found a place online where you can order material that is basically off cuts and old lines of material that they don't want it anymore they're not selling it anymore so they just bundle it up and you don't know what it's going to be like the patterns or the colors but it's a cool surprise so I'm going to have a crack at making clothes hopefully just get better at repairing upcycling and generally not having to buy clothes at all exactly it's it's skills and skills are Skills are good. My second uh, eco whoop is cycling. Also something that I have noticed, a lot of people are getting on their bikes because uh, the advice currently is that cycling is safer than taking public transport. Um, hopefully that movement is going to spread and going to grow uh, because I think we can make London and the whole world uh, cycle friendly and the more people cycle, the more infrastructure has to be improved um, to support cyclists. Totally. People are often like, oh, I would cycle, but not in London. So, yeah, if that infrastructure could make them feel safer, then we'd get more cyclists. Woo! Sorry, cars, but you just have to uh, have to wait until we all get to where we have to go. Yes. We have got to where we have to go, which is the end of the episode. Exactly. And this episode, we have something special for you. The wonderful Jessica Akalina, who is a friend of ours, has recorded a poem from Love and Information by Carol Churchill. And we're going to end this episode with that little treat for you guys. And it's so aptly called The Climate. I'm frightened. Just walk instead of driving and don't take so many hot baths. I'm frightened for the children. There were those emails, those scientists, I can't remember the detail. No, it didn't make any difference in the end. No, I think you're right. Most scientists all agree it's a catastrophe. The question is, how bad a catastrophe? It's whether they drown or starve or get killed in fights for water. I choose drowning. Are you really not going to take this seriously? I don't know how to. I don't know how to.